the very nice thing with our consortium is that this is really a big family. So there is a really friendly attitude with, with all the members I have. This is really friends, mean by many of my colleagues, not just colleagues. And that makes it really together with just the enormous success of the Gaia mission and the great astrometry and all the other products we are producing. This really makes it a great experience in my life, which I really would not like to miss. I would say that there are two things that I find most interesting. One is the technical side of getting the very best out of the observations. And the other is to see the marvelous science that come out of these measurements in the end. The, the data that Gaia is going to produce and the catalogs are going to be basically the reference in astronomy for the coming decades, impacting many, many areas of astronomy. And it shows uh, yeah, the things that we can do in Europe when we cooperate together. So something like Gaia could not be done by a single nation, but uh, with the cooperation of all the European countries, it's been made possible. So it shows uh, yeah, the kind of things that we can do in Europe when we work together and cooperate. Gaia mission provides a large variety of interesting challenges. The few scientific ones, but also the technical issues that processing such a huge amount of data provides. IDU design and operation has been very exciting from a point of view of an engineer like me. But of course, the experience of working for the last 13 years in Gaia with a large and heterogeneous team, including all the PAC members, colleagues from the University of Barcelona, and the Barcelona supercomputer team has been an endless source of inspiration and knowledge. We have a lot of bright people in Deepak, and I'm not sure that without Deepak, I would meet so many bright people. But Gaia is not like other space projects in my head. I was fascinated from the very different areas which suddenly are open for me. I can work in Gaia and can contribute to very, very different things, not only to my area of expertise. Gaia is amazing because of the problems which can be treated within data processing with Gaia, scientific problems like binary stars, like variable stars, like a lot of subjects. So Gaia is really fascinating. And I am already 20 years in Gaia and I'm still uh, looking at Gaia like a small children in front of the Christmas tree. I have a lot of things which are all extremely interesting. Gaia is just such a great mission. There is so much great science coming out of Gaia. I'm so proud to be working for this great project. Gaia is awesome. Welcome Dr. Michael Biermann from the Center of Astronomy of the University of Heidelberg. Michael, you are the manager of the Coordination Unit 3 in the Gaia Data Processing and Analysis Consortium. What is the role of the Coordination Unit 3 or CU3 within the Gaia mission? Yeah, thank you, Stefan. The aim of Gaia is to provide a census of the stars and other objects of the Milky Way and beyond. And the CO3, the Coordination Unit 3, within DPAC, aims at providing the astrometry for all these sources. What kind of data entering the Gaia catalogs is coming from the CO3? So astrometry, that is about the positions, mainly the positions of the stars, plus the distances whenever possible, plus proper motions for all those stars where we clearly see that they move over the sky this time. That is the main data products coming from CO3, plus a few other parameters and flags which indicate whether the solutions we do provide are of very high quality or whether there is something still fishy with these data. Fishy meaning that we either don't have yet enough observations, that is mainly at the very faint end, or whether they are indications for duplicity, so whether we may be seeing a binary system. That is not what CO3 is working on. That is another coordination unit which takes care of those sources. But we give some hints with the flex and auxiliary data we also provide with the astrometry in getting a clue on what we are really seeing there. In order to determine all these parameters, several steps starting from the Gaia raw observations up to the positions, proper motions, and parallaxes or distances of the star, and all the parameters that we were additionally talking about, several steps are necessary. Without going too much into the details, 
Can you describe us the necessary steps to create the astrometric data in the Gaia catalogs? Before we see for the very first time data really from the satellite in CO3, there's a long way for these data to arrive. That is mainly going from the satellite to the ground stations, which collect the data, send them to ESOC, that is the European Space Operations Center, where Gaia is operated, that is close to Darmstadt in Germany. And from there, the data is transferred to our data centers. Uh, one is in Barcelona, where the first steps are done, and the other one is at ESOC, close to Madrid in Spain, where the astrometry at the end is done. So the very first steps we do with the data coming from the satellite is to transfer them, to store them in a data format that is more easy to use for the downstream processes. And then the very first thing is that we calibrate these data, a rough first calibration that allows us to determine the fluxes we, we see for, from every single observation, the centroids of every single observation. So when the star has been observed, where on the sky? And these data at the end then are cross-matched. So we link every single observation we do with Gaia to stars, yeah, so that we have a census of all the objects we are dealing with and know for every single object which observations really are linked to that. And once we have this information, then we can do the real astrometry, that is the determination of the high position, positions, proper motions, uh, parallaxes, etc. So this is a long sequence of many, many steps before we really arrive at the data products we really publish in the different catalogs. We have provided so far and will do in the future. The DPAC consortium and the astronomers and software engineers of the CU3 are distributed all over Europe. How do you coordinate these different groups? That is mainly done by really talking to each other many times. So this goes from a very small group meetings, just with very specialized particular goals to really focus on and to work on. Also going to larger meetings where different groups really come together, which have a closer cooperation to coordinate things, you know, to discuss what the next steps are and what needs to be taken into account when using these or that data to really larger meetings where the whole coordination unit really comes together yeah, to give people an overview of where we are and uh, to co coordinate on a wider range, really up to, at the end, having really big meetings for the whole consortium yeah, to come together, not only to socialize, but also really to see what is done in the different CUs and how this at the end will all fit together for a catalog we are aiming to produce. It's not only about coordinating CU3, but you also have to coordinate together with the other CUs to finally right. get the real catalog done, uh, Michael. I understand that you probably have specific problems to do with all this coordination task in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, we are in a really lucky situation with, with Deepak, with our consortium, because our consortium has been built uh, more than 15 years ago, and it has been rather stable with, with the people that contribute to the production of the Gaia catalogs. So we know each other for 10 years, maybe 15 years already. Uh, that makes it a lot easier you know, to really continue working with just uh, online meetings, uh, not seeing each other face to face as we used to do so in, in, in former times so or more than a year ago. That makes it rather easy and efficient still, you know, because we know each other so well, we know what we have to do. And that is why we continue having meetings uh, more regular. Meanwhile, you know, we have more online meetings than we had in the past, because we just uh, miss the face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, but with these meetings and with the many people we know for many years, we can still efficiently work on the things we have still have to do without really having a big loss in, in efficiency. Surely there is a little bit of a drop, for sure, or the parents which have children in homeschooling and need to take care of them are less efficient than they had been before. But overall, I don't see really any real reduction in our inefficiency. So things are really going very smoothly, I have to say. On December 3, 2020, the first part of the third Gaia catalog has been published in which astrometry plays a major role. Can you briefly describe what data are included in this catalog and how precise these data are? What we have published in EDS3 in astrometry kind of resembles what we have done before. That is really the standard astrometry. That is the positions, parallaxes, and proper motions, plus this auxiliary data, which gives you a hint on whether this is a binary system or whether the source has suffered that uh, observing history and is not yet on a comparable level than the other sources in terms of accuracy. 
So that is uh, from the data products, very similar to what we have provided in DR2. But of course, it's a lot more precise. So because we had more data to look at, also we have included a lot better calibration. So that is what we have mainly worked on over the past years and which we will continue to work on for the next data releases. So overall, in the proper motions, we have improved by a factor two or so. And for the positions and parallaxes, that is by a factor of 20 or 30 percent. So quite something to really get better astronomy out of that. While astronomers are now using this fantastic star catalog for their science, CO3 is already working. You have indicated that on the astrometry of the next data releases to even improve that and have a more comprehensive and more precise catalog. What additional data are expected and what was discussed at the CO3 meeting that which we just had? We will again have kind of double the data than we had before as the input data. So we again will see similar improvements in the accuracy. But on top of that, we will also for the very first time in DPAC uh, publish the epoch astrometry. So that is, uh, simply speaking, the individual observations that really are used in producing this catalog to give the science community and everybody else who is interested in this a chance to really pick up those observations they are really interested in and not just rely on the data reduction we have done in our consortium. Um, that is quite a big task to do all this in parallel. And during the CO3 meeting we just had, uh, we discussed best ways to really schedule things, to organize them, also together with all the other CUs yeah, to make these things happen in time. So that was a major part of this coordination unit meeting uh, to plan all these things that will come over the next few years. Michael, thank you very much for this interview. Many thanks, Stefan. Welcome, Professor Linde Green from the University of Lund in Sweden. Leonard, already 20 years ago, you invented the basis for Gaia's astrometric solution. And in 2001, you mathematically defined the basic steps, how positions, proper motions, and parallaxes or distances of stars and other celestial bodies can be determined from the individual Gaia observations. Can you briefly explain to us the logic behind ages the astrometric global iterative solution for Gaia? I will start by saying a few words about how Gaia works. I'm sure you already know this, but uh, let me explain it from my point of view. So there are two telescopes in Gaia, and each of them can be thought of as a big digital camera that sweeps across the sky as the satellite rotates around its axis. And Every five seconds or so, a snapshot is taken of the part of the sky to which the camera is pointing right then. So over, say, five years, you will get about 30 million such snapshot or frames covering the whole sky. And each frame contains tens of thousands of star images. Now, the problem is to put together all these observations of the stars into a consistent system of positions, parallaxes, and propagations over the whole sky. So how is that possible? Well, if you, if you go back and look at one of these frames containing maybe 10,000 star images, if you knew exactly where on the sky this frame had been taken, you could simply project it back on the celestial sphere and that would immediately give you the positions of these stars at the time when the frame was taken. But of course we don't know the exact pointing of the telescope at that time. So how can we determine the pointing of the telescope? Well, if we knew the positions of the stars, it would be simple to work out the exact pointing of this frame. So we have this apparently unsolvable problem that in order to determine the positions, we need to know the pointings of the telescope. But in order to compute the pointings, we need to know the positions of the stars. And indeed, if you only had one frame like this, it would not be possible to solve this. But remember that for every star, it has been recorded in hundreds of these frames. And that opens a possibility to solve this problem. 
for imagine that you start with the star positions that are not very accurate. You could take them from existing catalogs, even the old ground-based catalogs that all astronomers have in their libraries. Starting with these positions, you can compute approximate pointings of the telescope for all the frames. And then if you use these pointings to compute the positions of the stars, you will get positions that are a little bit better than the ones you started with. And then you can use them to compute the pointings again, and so on. You can loop through this determination of the star parameters and the pointing parameters as many times as you want. And when you have done it a sufficient number of times, the results will not change anymore. Then you have reached mathematical convergence. And then you have the solution that you want, which simultaneously determines both the positions, parallaxes, and propagations of the stars and the pointings of the telescope at the corresponding times. So that basically solves the problem. Now, in reality, it is, of course, much more complicated for you need to take into account that the instrument does many strange things with the observations. So simultaneously with all these star parameters and pointings, you also have to determine a large number of instrument parameters that describe the distortion of the instrument and how that changes with time and so on. But you can incorporate this also in this scheme, in this loop that you go through many times, and that determines these parameters in addition. So that basically solves the problem. Of course, there are many mathematical details that need to be worked out, but in principle, that is how it is done. So in principle, it is quite simple. Yeah, quite simple is something <laughs> that you say. Thank you very much for describing this in a very good way to understand the, the basis of it. But of course, it's a very complex solution. Aegis was used in all previous catalogs. The latest was the Gaia Early Data Release 3, published on December 3, 2020, containing more than 1.7 billion stars. How accurate are the data in this catalog? Uh, well, it, it depends a lot on the brightness of the stars. Uh, the very brightest stars, in fact, all that you can observe with the naked eyes, are not very accurately observed because they are simply too bright for Gaia. And the faintest stars that Gaia can observe are not so accurate either, but somewhere in between you get the best accuracy. And then we are talking about something like 15 or 20 micro arc seconds for the parallaxes. And how can one visualize how big 20 or 30 micro arc seconds are? Well, I like to illustrate this by means of a millimeter ruler. Everybody knows how big a millimeter is. And if you look at a millimeter from a distance of 200 meters, that occupies an angle of one arc second. So this is an angle that you can't see with your naked eye, but with a good telescope, it should be no problem to resolve the millimeter scale at that distance. Now, for Hipparchus, for example, we measured accuracies in milli arc seconds. That is a thousandth of an arc second. And to get that, you would have to place this ruler at the distance of 200 kilometers. And that is actually such a small angle that you would hardly not be able to see it even with the biggest telescopes. But Gaia can measure it, of course. And Gaia can even measure something like 100 times better than that, almost. And that means that you would have to put this ruler halfway to the moon or something like that. Then you would get a scale in micro arc seconds. And how is it possible to reach such an incredible accuracy? Well, first of all, you need an instrument that is really extremely good. And Gaia is extremely good. We have heard that there are some problems with Gaia, that the basic angle is not as stable as it should be and so on. But in spite of all that, it's a fantastic instrument, really. And the engineers have done a marvelous job in getting it that good. And of course, you, you need an instrument that is capable of giving extremely sharp images, basically just limited by the fundamental wave nature of light diffraction, and also extremely stable. It has to be stable over timescales of days and weeks and even months in order to be able to produce the results that we want. So the engineers have really done a very good job in this respect. Yes. Gaia is still measuring the stars, hopefully in, for another three or four years. By how much can the accuracy of the Gaia catalog still be improved? And what are the major challenges? 
when it comes to the parallaxes, I think they will be at least a factor of two better in the end than they are in the early data release three. And for the propagations, it will be an even bigger factor, maybe five or six, because there we also benefit from the longer time baseline over the, which the motions are measured from a longer mission. And these improvements by a factor two to five really mean very much to astronomers. It, it may not sound groundbreaking, but I think it is in terms of the kind of science that can be done with these measurements. When you look back to the time when you, together with a few others, proposed a new astrometric satellite right after the successful Hipparchos mission, has Gaia up to now fulfilled the expectations you had at that time? I would say that it has surpassed the expectations because uh, in early data release three, we basically reached the accuracy that was targeted for a five years mission based on only three years of data. Of course, there are, there, are, there are still problems to iron out, but I have no doubt whatsoever that this will be possible to solve in the coming years. And with all the additional data that we will get in the extended mission, it will be even much more better. Lena, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Welcome, Jose Hernandez from the European Space Astronomy Center, ISAC, close to Madrid. Jose, you are the technical manager of AGES, the Gaia Astrometric Global Iterative Solution. Leonard Lindegreen has already given us an overview on the scientific background and the important steps to produce the Gaia catalog from the individual observations. What is your role in AGES and how many astronomers and software engineers are working in your team? Hello, Stefan. Yes, so I'm managing and coordinating the GIS team. Basically, most of the, the work is basically coordinating the, the activities performed by uh, more than 15 people, which are basically from the, the AGIS teams. We have scientists uh, specialized in astrometry, like uh, Lena Rindegren or Sergey Kleoner. And we also have a team of software engineers and computer scientists, basically, with a uh, yeah, strong background in uh, mathematics and instrument calibration. So my main role is basically to coordinate and plan the activities so that we can plan and deliver the solutions that basically form the part of the Gaia data releases in due time, basically. What are the technical steps to produce the Gaia astrometric solution and how long does it take? Yeah, the, the production of the solution itself takes a relatively short time, something like about a month. There are many different stages, steps that we, we need to do. But before that, there's been a lot of preparatory work and we have done many, many tests, experimental runs, trying to improve our calibration model. <clears throat> That's basically what it takes most of the time. So this is what we do in order to try to optimize and get the best solution with the data available and the time constraints that we have. And this is a process that typically takes last more than one year and also involves other team where we basically try to understand the data, its behavior, trying to, to get the best possible solution for a given guide data release. Also, there is a lot of work related to validation of the solutions, scientific validation, and also documenting and publishing the, the solution itself. What are the main challenges and difficulties in the production of the solution? So basically, we are now at the level of the microseconds, so we're trying to, to get rid of systematic errors and random errors that we have, which are very small, the tens of microseconds or hundreds of microseconds. This is extremely hard, basically. It means that we need to try to find the reasons for these effects, which are very subtle. Most of the time, basically, is spent trying to remove them by modding them, basically. To make an analogy, maybe uh, what we are doing is similar to climbing a mountain. So the Gaia data release one and Gaia data release two were probably at the beginning of the climb, where you can advance very quickly uh, with relatively little effort. And then now with Gaia data release four and the final data release five, we're basically getting closer to the summit, where basically it's very steep and the conditions are much harsh. And then it requires a lot of effort basically to uh, reach the summit and getting rid of these smaller, smaller errors that we have. Yeah, and it's getting harder because you have to take into account smaller and smaller effects, which are difficult to understand. Indeed, yeah. 
In 2016 and 2018, the first two Gaia data releases were published. And on December 3, 2020, the first part of the third Gaia catalog was made publicly available, containing data for about 1.8 billion stars. Now you are already working on the next data releases. What will be the main improvements? So in data release four, we're going to double the amount of data that we are using. This uh, already will improve the solution because it gives you more, more measurements, basically. Uh, so random errors and especially proper motions uh, will become more accurate automatically. But also the, there has been a lot of improvements in the systems that uh, produce the data used by AGS as input, basically intermediate data update, uh, which basically computes the, determines the image parameter determination, uh, has improved. So the, the quality of the data that we will use as input is better. And then in AGS, we continue to improve our calibration models. So data release four is for, uh, going to be much better than data release three in terms of uh, systematic errors allowing the astronomers to, to go to reach further and further. More and more valuable data for astronomy on a higher and higher precision. Jose, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you, Stefan. Welcome Dr. Xavier Castaneda from the University of Barcelona. Xavier, you are the manager of the intermediate data updating within the CU3. IDU is an important step before the Aegis solution can be performed. Can you briefly describe to us what intermediate data updating means in the context of Gaia's astrometric calibration? IDU is in charge of two main tasks, the calibration of the astrometric instrument and the image processing of all the ATKAI measurements to derive location of the sources and the fluxes. Location and fluxes are computed by processing the tiny images that the spacecraft sends on ground and using different instrument calibrations that are also performed in IDU. In order to perform IDU, a lot of computer power is needed. Can you tell us what computers you are using for IDU? The data management and processing power needed to produce the Gaia catalog releases is one of the most challenging aspects of the Gaia mission. For the third Gaia data release, we have processed up to 78 billion observations from the first 34 months of data. And for the next release, we will process twice this data. For this reason, IDU needs a lot of computing power and it runs in the most powerful supercomputer in Spain, Mare Nostrum, hosted at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. In its latest upgrade, Mare Nostrum offers a peak performance of 13 petaflops and a disk storage capacity of 14 petabytes, which are more than enough for IDU processing. In fact, for the latest release, IDU has performed one to the 21 floating operations, one sextillion, or what is the same, 1,000 million, million, million floating point operations. And we estimate that for the next release, we will need 10 times this amount of processing power. Mare Nostrum has more than 150,000 processing cores which are more or less equivalent to 20,000 high-end personal computers. And for the latest release, IDU has used up to 300 of these cores simultaneously, which are less than 1% of the full machine. You and your team has already run the IDU task for the previous Gaia catalogs, as you have mentioned. What major improvements in IDU do you expect to make the next Gaia catalogs even more accurate than the previous ones? The accuracy of the forthcoming Gaia catalog will, in principle, progressively improve as new data is fed to the processing change. We have used 34 months of data, and for the next release, we will have twice this data volume. But of course, what we also need to do is to evolve our calibration models and calibration solutions to the evolving condition of the astrometric instrument. Basically, we need to know more accurately how the instrument responds to the different objects observed by Gaia. For example, uh, how the instrument responds to the different brightness or color of the sources. 
The results for the latest run of IDU show a strong time and source color dependence that clearly indicates the varying condition of the instrument during the mission. And we have already identified which parts of both the calibration models and the full calibration pipeline have to be improved for the next release. Furthermore, we aim to improve the completeness and resolution of the Gaia catalog by implementing far more sophisticated image processing anchor match to resolve scenarios where we have close objects or scenarios around the crowded regions in the sky. All these updates will reduce the systematics and will produce smaller errors in the final astrometric solution. Xavier, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you for your time and you're welcome. Welcome, Professor Sergei Kiyoda from the Technical University of Dresden. Sergei, Einstein's theory of relativity plays an important role for the Gaia mission. Can you explain to us what kind of relativistic effects have to be considered in the analysis of the Gaia data? Hi, Stefan. I will try to explain this. Actually, the most uh, amazing aspect of Gaia is its accuracy. And to reach this accuracy technically is one story. It is a lot of technical efforts, but to interpret the measurements so that you make sense out of it from the scientific point of view is another story. And on this process, during this process of interpretation, one important aspect is relativity. So at the level of one microsecond, there are a lot of relativistic effects which play a role here in these measurements and should be taken into account. It starts with a very, very well-known classical astronomical effect, which is aberration. So the aberration should be considered with full uh, relativistic accuracy to reach this one microsecond. But this is known thing. You, you need some sort of Lorentz transformation, basically. But to be able to apply this Lorentz transformation in the correct place, you need the whole uh, theory of relativistic reference frames, a whole a career of the reference frames, starting with the reference frame around Gaia, which is physically adequate for an observer moving together with Gaia, and then farther and farther, basically uh, the barycentric reference frame and so on and so on. In this process, you should define also the meaningful definitions of all the parameters which you have during the data processing. For example, the motion of, of Gaia in which reference frame and which uh, coordinate system you want to describe this. It comes as external data, for example, and you have to make sure which meaning these uh, coordinates have and velocity, for example, for the aberration. It ends basically to the relativistic definitions of the astrometric uh, parameters of each source, which we are using, for example, relativistic definition of parallax and proper motions. It is absolutely not obvious. It, it did not exist before Gaia, that we have a strict relativistic definitions of all those parameters. And in the middle of all this process, I mean, on that one side, you have uh, relativistic aberration. And on the other side, you have these definitions of parallaxes and proper motions and relativistically meaningful way you need to find them. In the middle, you have somewhere light propagation from a, a object on the sky, somewhere a star, and you have a Gaia here and th this light is propagating. This is basically the, the media which we observe, and uh, we need to, uh, to model this motion of photons, of, of light rays, basically, to very high accuracy. And also classical effects of light bending, which, well, most of people know, have heard anyway, and this should be modeled to very, very high precision and accuracy. So, for example, we need to take into account not only the classical light deflection in the gravitational field of the sun, but also uh, we need to take into account uh, smaller gravitational fields uh, from the planets of the solar system, for example. It was basically my first contribution to Gaia, 
and it was an amazing adventure, so to say, to, to put all this together so that it works and makes sense. After we have done this, it looks very simple, but only afterwards. Relativistic effects not only have to be considered, but there are also experiments in relativity and fundamental physics, for instance, using the Gaia measurements close to the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, and the other planets. You already mentioned that this has to be taken into account, but this will also be used as an experiment. Can you shortly describe this experiment? This relativistic model has uh, many ingredients. You put and you, you should consider many effects. And as basic principle, what you put in, you can test in principle. So starting from the average, you write down all the formulas, you will see that Gaia can be used as a very strange and very expensive michelson morlins experiment where we can really test if the standard models for the uh, light aberration are really adequate, really describe what the nature tells us. And this will be also done. Other aspect is the light bending, which we already discussed. And one interesting aspect is this uh, light bending in the gravitational fields of the bodies of the solar system, like planets. The sun is one story, but the planets is another story. And the biggest planet is, of course, Jupiter, but we have also other planets. So Saturn, for example, is also very important. And in these cases, we can observe very close to these objects, to Jupiter and Saturn. In case of uh, the sun, Gaia cannot observe very close to, to the sun, only at 45 degrees. But uh, for Jupiter and Saturn, we can observe very close to these objects. And we write down the formulas uh, describing the light deflection close to those bodies, we will see that there are many different effects which contribute at the level of accuracy which Gaia can reach. So one aspect is the light deflection as such. So the, the, the mass of the body affect the light rays. And then you have also the smaller effects. So the effects due to translational motion of the bodies. Also rotational motion, upper rotational motion, the effects are too small even for Gaia, for those objects. But also effects of the oblateness of the body. The, the, the body, I mean, Jupiter and Saturn uh, are not uh, spheres. So they are ellipsoids, and this gives you additional gravitational field. And this affects also the light deflection. So all this uh, will be mapped with Gaia. How successfully we should see, but at least these are our plans. To, to test everything we can test with this data. And this is certainly a very interesting result which Gaia will provide, hopefully, in the future. Yeah, additionally, to your work on relativity, you and your group in Dresden are also improving the calibration of the Gaia satellite for every new data release in order to bring the already incredible large accuracy of Gaia to the very limit. What kind of improvements are you working on? So we do actually different things. Uh, here in Dresden, we have a possibility to run the so-called primary solutions of edges. So basically, we, we have the opportunity to test different parameterizations in edges with real data. And the main direction where we contribute is to calibrate the instrument for variations which are quicker than the rotational period of the satellite, quicker than six hours. In the classical approach for data processing for scanning satellites like Gaia, or also for, for Hipparchus, it was used like this, more or less, there is a very, very important assumption. And the assumption is that the instrument is stable over the, the periods of, say, two or three rotational periods of the satellite. And if it is like this, so it's stable, you don't need to calibrate it, you, you just assume it is constant over, say, three days. Uh, all the geometry of the instrument is constant over three days. Then you can relatively easy, relatively, everything is rel relatively easy, uh, calibrate the instrument. It is, of course, also very, very difficult and important task to calibrate even such an instrument. I'm not saying it is really easy, no. But it gets to a very different problem if you, if you can't assume it. And you really have an instrument which is changing with time over the periods over six hours, nine hours, or whatever, small periods of time. And to calibrate this sort of uh, variations is, is a very special challenge. 
And it turns out that for Gaia to reach the ultimate accuracy, we need to calibrate them. We do see in the instrument these variations, which is uh, basically normal as a, I mean, Gaia is, is a physical body, which is not a rigid body. It cannot be a rigid body. And it is rotating and the heat flows uh, from the sun basically somehow contributes to the thermal dynamical changes in the body. And all this plays a role at our incredible accuracy, which Gaia can achieve. And we are trying to calibrate this with uh, quite a lot of success, but uh, by definition, unfortunately, it is not easy to calibrate. And by definition, it is not possible to calibrate fully. So you need to take into account what you cannot calibrate and what you can calibrate. And then it is a very subtle problem, basically. So we have some successes on this way. And for example, in the last Gaia early data release three, using this approach, we were able to improve the parallax zero point from Gaia, from Gaia own observations, not from astrophysical considerations. Like we take quasars and say, okay, quasars should uh, have parallaxes zero. No, we just use the, the Gaia data itself and so and still consider Gaia parallaxes as absolute parallaxes to some accuracy of course and this accuracy will also improve also for the parallax but there are many aspects also for this relativistic tests which we mentioned already it plays a role and for the overall accuracy of the Gaia products. Yeah this is very important work for getting really Gaia to the limit. Sergey thank you very much for this interview. Yeah, you're welcome. Gaia's goal is to provide astrometry and photometry down to very faint objects in the sky. These celestial objects, mostly stars, have what astronomers call magnitude 21, and their brightness corresponds to about a candle in a 30,000 kilometers distance. However, there are some small regions in the sky where stars are missed by Gaia. I will talk about this now with Dr. Katja Weingerl, who is an expert on this question. Katja, can you explain to us what kind of regions these are which are missed by Gaia? Gaia usually looks at the sky, and if there is a star, it places such a readout window around the star, and then this readout window is downlinked to Earth. And then later in this readout window, you find the source that you want to see or this star or object. And then you can see how bright it is and uh, where it exactly lies. Now, some regions on the sky are so dense. So there are so many sources next to each other that Gaia just can't handle it this way. Because if you would have such a readout window, there would be 15 sources in it. And you, it would be all these readout windows overlapping, and it, it's just an overkill to the standard procedures. So therefore, standard Gaia doesn't work for very, very crowded regions. What is the technical reasons for this limitation? The reason is that the, the downlink of all these windows is very cost in intensive. And of course, you could have these 15 overlapping windows, but it will still be relatively incomplete. And also, they would be overlapping a lot, so you would downlink basically the same data 15 times. And this, this is just not a very good idea. And therefore, for these very dense regions, actually it's nine regions that were selected in the beginning of the mission. For these regions, CIF images, this is two-dimensional images obtained by the sky mapper, are downlinked to Earth in whole. So the whole big region is downlinked as one image. And now these images can be analyzed. And of course, you are not taking one image of these nine regions once. No, Gaia is scanning, this, scanning these regions again and again. So it's looking at a certain region and then it comes back. And every time Gaia touches these regions, this will trigger a readout for these SIF images. And then a SIF image is taken when such a dense region is visible. But of course, you have to identify which star from one exposure is the star on the other exposure. How is this done and what kind of process is done in order to solve this problem? Yeah, this is very right. There's several steps that need to be done first before you get your proper source. 
uh, location and brightness. The first thing is in this one image, which is very crowded, so there's very many sources in it, you need to disentangle which source is or which object is which object. And actually their light distributions are overlaying on top of each other. So it's really hard to disentangle them. This is the first step. Once you got all these things disentangled, you got each object has one detection in one image. And then you have the next image. And again, each object has one detection in this image. And then you need to find all these detections together and group them so that all observations of the same source are grouped together and you find which observation belongs to which source. And then you can calculate this, the source position and brightness from this. This step is called cross match. And once you got that, once the cross match is done, then you take your sources and then you actually do the real calculations, which then determine the astrometry, which is the exact position of the source and the photometry, which is the brightness of the source. Um, and then these are the things that we want to publish in the end. So the positions and the brightness of all these sources in this huge, very filled set images. So you are managing the group which is responsible for this task in the Gaia Data Processing and Analysis Consortium. So we can expect from your group that the holes that are still in the current Gaia catalogs will be filled? Yeah, exactly. So actually, this is a very small group because we are just two to three people and we started working roughly two years ago. So it's, it's actually a, a very small fraction. And we are now done with the first two steps, as I said, and we aim for doing astrometry and photometry in the next one or two years. And then the full Gaia catalog is going to contain also the SIF sources, which means that the dense regions, which now have holes, and you can actually visually see that there's less detections in the center of these dense regions, um, that will be filled up. So there will be no longer holes in the centers of these dense regions. And even the people working on stellar clusters or on the center of our Milky Way will have complete or, or complete or more complete data sets. So we are very much looking forward to have this more complete Gaia catalog. Katja, thank you very much for this interview. Yeah, thanks to you, Stefan.